better. Yeah, that's good. Okay, um, right, so I'm going to start off just with some context around uh, erosion in the New Zealand landscape and in, uh, and in Tasman District just to provide more of a broader uh, national picture because part of the issue that we face in dealing with questions like the correct classification of the land and the erosion susceptibility classification um, does result, relate to uh, the rest of the country. It's a national classification, it's not a local uh, classification. Um, so we need a national perspective to understand why the land is classified the way it is and why it responds the way it does. Um, I'm going to talk about what is it about the separation point that makes it particularly difficult uh, to manage and then focus for most of the time on what are the risks in forestry. It's, to, to me, what I'm going to present to me is sort of a balance view around forestry, that forestry has an upside and a downside and, and we're trying to balance uh, the, the, those two sides. It was referred to many years ago in about 1990 I think as the plantation forestry paradox uh, because there is an um, important positive benefit that comes from forestry but there are some serious risks which um, are realised from time to time and then from place to place. Um, and then I'm going to turn to the question of risk manage management because I think that's really what we're here uh, for today is to talk about how do we better manage those risks of uh, forestry on separation point ground. And I think there is a way ahead um, and there's obviously been some strong views expressed already about uh, blanket prohibition of forestry. Uh, that's one option that's obviously got to be on the table. Um, got to remember that it's a really important industry for this region so that has some serious consequences. Um, but I am, the last slide is about what greater stringency might um, look like and the questions have already been asked about why hasn't greater stringency already been um, exercised um, to me is a very interesting one. Right, first slide. Right, I want to start at the end and talk about some key messages and most of the talk is about supporting uh, these messages. So erosion is a natural feature of the New Zealand landscape, um, basically as a result of our position uh, on the globe and our particular geology. Uh, so a, a goal of stopping it is not a feasible goal, so we've got to recognise that we are going to have erosion occurring no matter what we do, but there isn't a, we can manage it to a certain extent both through land management practices and through vegetation um, practices. But the, I guess the key message that we'll all agree on is that forestry has that really risky post-harvest period and that's the part where we really need uh, to focus on if we're going to move forward. Um, and I, to me, part of the way forward is about better recognising that risk, and I'll argue later on that the National Environmental Standard for Plantation and Forestry does a woeful job of recognising the risk uh, and of helping us to develop strategies to minimise it. Right, next slide. So in a, in a uh, global and national context, New Zealand produces a hell of a lot of sediment uh, for the land area that we occupy on the globe. About 1.7% of the whole total load of sediment to the ocean uh, in, on the world comes from us, from less than 0.2% uh, of the land area. And that's really a result of our geological position on a plate boundary, um, the rapid uplift, uh, the crushed and shattered rocks that produces uh, a lot of steep slopes and we're subject to really high rainfall, no better um, illustrated than the last week or two. Land cover and management tends to be a secondary influence uh, on that and that might not be a message that uh, resonates with people in this room, but from a national perspective and in terms of the modelling that's been done in recent years, that's most definitely the case. Um, erosion and sediment yield is highly variable spatially and um, some recent data uh, compiled as part of the freshwater policy development for New Zealand that looks at the distribution of sediment yield throughout New Zealand with the, the greens being the lowest uh, sediment yield. Sediment yield is being used here as a proxy for erosion rates. It's, it's much more difficult to directly measure erosion than it, than it is to measure uh, load in our rivers. So this data is sediment load as a proxy for erosion rate. And you can see that, that all the brown uh, areas are in the really wet areas of the Southern Alps uh, or in the really soft rock crust geology um, in the North Island soft rock hill country which has just been hammered over the last um, few days.
Yeah, so one, one of the things that um, Murray Hicks and colleagues from NIWA were able to do, uh, having that, what they did was develop a model of sediment yield in our rivers based on driving factors like uh, rainfall, uh, land characteristics, uh, slope steepness, uh, and vegetation cover. The first time that vegetation cover has been factored in on a national basis. Um, and what they were then able to do was take all of the areas that have been cleared of native vegetation, convert them back uh, to native vegetation, forest cover, uh, where it was forest cover, and then recalculate the sediment load. So for the first time, we were able to come up with a number on what were the pre-human sediment loads compared to current sediment loads. And uh, probably surprisingly to everybody in this room, including myself, is what that data showed was that for the North Island, uh, the pre-human sediment load is about 80, uh, yeah, 70 per cent of, no, in the North Island it's about 80 per cent of what the current sediment load uh, was and for the South Island it's about 70 per cent. Um, and the reason for that is that as I uh, said before, that uh, vegetation is a secondary influence. The primary influence is we're still operating uh, before we cleared a lot of the land. So having a look at what that looks like for uh, Tasman District, um, the, the spatial variation, there's a pattern of spatial variation in uh, Tasman District which again is primarily a function of rainfall and geology and I've plotted on that right hand diagram the outline of separation point granite in the magenta and you can see that um, most of the separation point granite occurs in from what from a sediment load point of view is actually relatively low erosion rates. Probably doesn't match people's experience in the room but that's what the data uh, for uh, Tasman region the pre-human load is about 95% of the current load. And the major reason for that is that we haven't cleared most of the steep slopes. Most of them are still in native vegetation and most of what we've cleared is on relatively flat lying land. So uh, that's a pretty surprising number, um, but that again is what the, the models and the data suggest. Because that's a question that's come up frequently in the past about what do we know about the natural rates of erosion and how do current uh, loads compare and this is the first time we've been able to answer that data from a river load point of view at least. Right, so uh, moving on to what is it about granite um, that makes it a, an issue for us in terms of forestry management. Granite is a coarse grain igneous rock. So it's a rock that's formed well below the surface, it's cooled very slowly, it produces very very coarse crystals, um, sand sized uh, crystals and you'll all be familiar uh, with separation point granite when it breaks down in the sand layer that it produces in the rivers. It's a very hard rock, believe it or not, um, and it's a very strong rock and typically it's a very stable rock. Uh, and the uh, picture on the right shows Fiordland. That's a very similar rock to separation point granite. Um, but, and that's typical of a granite landscape through much of the world uh, where we're in young landscapes. And that's the key feature about Tasman, if we go to the next slide. In Tasman district, the granite is typically deeply weathered uh, from metres to tens of metres deep. Uh, that surprisingly reflects a long history of stability to allow that weathering to occur. So most of the soils on separation point granite uh, range from uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of years old, possibly even millions of years old. Uh, and it's that deep weathering that really creates the problems for us. Um, so as a result, it loses a lot of its strength. It produces that coarse sandy sediment, which is uh, fairly easily mobilized. Um, and it's prone to landslides, debris flow, and a wide variety of other erosion processes. Now, does everybody in the room know what debris flows are? Anybody need me to explain what a debris flow is? No, good. I'm sure most of you have seen them in action. <laughs> Um, so as a result uh, of these characteristics, we do require really careful water management and erosion and sediment control. Uh, and that, with respect to forestry, uh, that's particularly important with the road and landing network. So the sort of things that result uh, from poor management, next slide. Uh, which some of you will undoubtedly have seen. So along your roads and the compacted areas you, you can get uh, really rampant um, sheet and rill erosion that can transform into gullies overnight uh, in a big storm. So water control is absolutely critical. Next slide is 
um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, with this scene um, from uh, Marahau in Cyclone Gita uh, with a lot of large landslides, uh, a lot of sediment delivered down into the floodplain. Uh, but in this case, uh, a lot of the landslides, uh, in this view at least, uh, occurred under native forest vegetation. And Chris is going to present some uh, information later on that illustrates what we found through analysing uh, the distribution of landslides around Sarkatangita uh, so recently. Did you just say that there were landslides under the native? Mm -hmm. yeah. The regenerating scrub primarily, but uh, yeah, na native forest. It's not the old native. No, but there was landslides under um, uh, mature native forest as well, not as many. Not uh, I can't comment on that. Chris might be able to, but we will come back to that um, later on when Chris presents his data, so just hold those questions in the meantime. Can you leave that on there? Mm -hmm. So, just because I don't have any photographs in what I'm talking about, it's just some data. So you need to look at those landslides, there's a, there's a road along the mid slope and there's a road along the top. And there are landslides that occur in relation to the roads and some that don't. So hold that. Let's move on to the next one. This, this will be another familiar scene to many of you. Um, that's, that's one of the worst aspects of, um, of landslides and debris flows uh, at Ligar Bay uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a place that probably should never have been built on in retrospect. Um, but to me the interesting thing about this scene and this place is that most of the landslides that occurred in that catchment were under mature pine trees. Uh, so in a storm that was described by TDC as a storm like no other, when uh, something of the order of 600 millimetres of rain fell, um, all hell breaks loose no, no matter what the vegetation cover is. So I think one of the things we have to get our mind around is what is it that we're attempting to manage? Because if we think we can manage um, storms like that, then I think we face a serious problem. Right, so I want to want to start uh, now on the discussion around forestry risks and begin um, with, I guess, the, the upside uh, forestry before focusing more on the downside of it. So we know that for about 25 of the 30 years of a plantation uh, forest um, rotation, it, forestry produces very low sediment yields and there's some quite compelling data um, to support that. But we know that for several years in what we refer to as a window of vulnerability, um, during and post the harvest, yields are elevated significantly and the degree to which they elevate depends largely on um, the storm conditions during that period of vulnerability. Yeah. What would your guess in the years be? About eight years. Yeah. Um, so by the time you get to canopy closure, things um, start to um, recover. So this is, this is data from the Packeris Tahi study in Hawke's Bay, which is the one study in New Zealand that uh, has followed uh, forestry uh, over a 12 year period from pre-harvest uh, through to post-harvest where we have pretty good solid data on uh, the sediment yields from forestry in uh, the green bars there and from pasture um, in the brown bars. And you can see that uh, it, each, each of the bars is uh, sediment loads uh, or sediment yields, sorry, during individual storm events because it's the storms that produce all of the sediment. Um, the intervening periods produce very little sediment despite the observation that um, you see sediment being delivered in between those storms, you definitely do see sediment being delivered but in terms of measured loads uh, it's usually pretty insignificant. So in that, in that pre-harvest period, you can see that the brown bars, so the sediment coming off pasture, is significantly higher than uh, the sediment coming from the forested catchment. Uh, once the roading and then the logging begins, then that situation reverses. So uh, the green bars uh, are larger than the brown bars, uh, so the, the forest is producing more sediment uh, than the pasture during that period. But it recovers surprisingly quickly uh, during that 
post-harvest period and you're back to where you were pre-harvest with the forest producing less sediment uh, than the pasture. But the other thing to note on that diagram is how much bigger the bars are on the right hand side of that diagram than the left hand side and that's primarily a response to storm conditions post-harvest being a lot more storms, uh, larger storms during that post-harvest period and it's really the storminess in the floods that uh, drive the sediment load. But anyway, over the full rotation, it was estimated that the pasture catchment produced two to, two to three times more sediment than the forested uh, catchment. So the message in the long term from a forestry perspective is that it's better for the land than pastoral farming. It might be unacceptable in that post-harvest period, uh, but in the longer term, um, there's more of a benefit from the load. So yes, yeah, so that's the, the bottom line message out of that study was that pasture produces more sediment uh, and I've already talked about the fact that uh, the response is uh, very much driven uh, by rainfall and determining exactly how high um, the sediment load. Well in, in, an, in an ideal world we'd set up studies where we could um, provide estimates of sediment load across a wide range of recurrence interval storms. That doesn't happen in the real world. Unfortunately mostly when you set up a study like that um, you get either a very small number of storms or no storms. Storm. So um, that's that's probably pretty typical of what happens in the sort of the small to medium sized events, but it doesn't factor in what happens in the really large events. And in, in terms of sediment load investigations, what we know is that 90% of the work gets done in 10% of the time. So the 10% of really large storms is what delivers most of your sediment load. So going on to the next slide, um, we don't have any of those long term uh, studies in the uh, Tasman area but what we do have is some data from small catchments, this being the herring. Um, this diagram uh, plots peak discharge which is a very good predictor of sediment load uh, in storm events against the, the sediment load in tonnes uh, and you can see that um, two sets of measurements shown there, uh, a set of measurements taken during harvest and a set of measurements showing post harvest and the trend line, you can see there's a very good trend line, uh, there's, there's an exponential relationship between discharge um, and sediment load, again illustrating the importance of rainfall and high flows, uh, but you can see that the, the trend line is stepped up by about an order of magnitude, so during um, harvesting our sediment load in that uh, study increased uh, by about an order of magnitude. Um, but again, there were no very large storms during uh, that study either, so it could be worse than that if next slide. Um, bottom line with respect to that side is that we know, or those couple of sides, is that we know that when we harvest, sediment load is going to go up. Um, and I guess the question we're here to, to discuss today is uh, to what extent is that acceptable and to what extent can we manage and reduce it? So just um, touching firstly on the positive benefits of forestry uh, because there is a good news story and that's around the fact that in uh, storms including some large storms and I'll show a photo in, the mo in a minute that many of you will probably have seen before is that mature forests whether they're native or plantation forests typically have 70 to 90 percent less land sliding uh, than grassland. Um, and we get a similar result when it comes to small forested catchments compared to pasture catchments. These are catchments of the order of uh, sort of 1 to 10 square kilometres because once you get beyond that you typically don't have a uh, single land use within catchments. So um, there's a, there is an issue around scaling to make statements like that at larger catchment scale. But th those first two bullet points uh, show that both, both the erosion is reduced uh, under mature forest cover and less sediment is delivered into our streams. We also know that uh, forests have been widely used to, to slow earth flow rates and to control landslide and gully erosion, particularly in the east coast of the North Island, less so here in the South Island. So just, I can make a comment on that. Mature forest, there's, there's no distinction between these kinds of studies between native forest radiator right forest, this species tall forest, because forests will reduce yeah. the amount of erosion. So you might want to say the question is should radiata be the tree of choice in future forests? Okay. Now that's something somebody might want to discuss and debate. I um, would. Yeah. Well, sure, yeah, sure, sure, but I mean that's, that's, that's the thing. But, Forest is very clear. Yeah. The science is unequivocal on this that 
forested landscapes, by and large, re reduce sediment. Reduce so this is a classic example from the Man of a Two 2004 storm, really big storm. Um, a recurrence interval probably 100 years or more, uh, and I mean it's self-evident the benefits of um, mature forest in that landscape, even though it's on very erodible rocks and it was a really large storm. It's, it's, I mean, to me it's somewhat ironic, we would have probably, as geomorphologists, we would have probably expected to see a little bit more landsliding in the mature uh, forest in a storm of that magnitude, but that's, that's a really powerful message for, um, or image, um, for a forester. No. And no. just to qualify that, if you do look within mature plantations like that, you will find some mm. small yes. landslides. Yeah. But the, the, the picture is pretty much tells the story. Yeah. And, and we have to understand that many of these landscapes, the trees were planted to provide that protection against what we see in the grassland. Right, moving on. Uh, another another example from the Wairau district pro probably looks very similar today to this, I would say. Um, the reason I put up these two images is just uh, bear in mind the picture of the extent of landsliding here and in that previous image. We don't see anything like that on Cyclone Gita typically. So the landslide densities under the likes for Cyclone Gita are lower than we, what we see on the Soft Rock Hill Country. And th this is why uh, Separation Point Granite is in the orange erosion susceptibility class and not in the red class. And this is much, much worse. What's that soil there? Uh, much uh, Yeah. And, and if, you, if you cast your mind back, even though that's a vertical and you looked at that one of the shaggery, the, some of the patterns of where the landslides are occurring mm -hmm. are yeah, move to the next one. Yeah. Right, so we know what causes the slope stability effects. There's, there's two major mechanisms uh, that operate. One is around the fact that the closed, closed tree canopy intercepts and evaporates uh, rainfall and reduces soil moisture. Um, so there's less moisture going into the soil um, and that helps your soil moisture balance um, and which can decrease um, soil strength. Um, there's a number of other things that go on in relation to uh, the hydrological effect. Um, there's an interesting question about the extent to which that operates in large storms when the canopy becomes saturated and the soils become saturated. <coughs> it would be our perception that uh, during those large events that, that uh, hydrological effect would be less important uh, than in the smaller events. And the other thing that happens that um, we all know is that the roots mechanically reinforce the slopes, so they provide a lot of additional um, soil strength uh, and reduce uh, the incidence of landsliding, um, which is something that Chris has worked on uh, for many years. And, and, and I can't help myself, sorry, because I'm very proud of this photograph. <laughs> How old do you think that tree is? Uh, 20 years. Yeah. Uh, 10, 10. What, what sort of tree is it? That's a poplar tree. tree grown from a pole and that was extracted at 34 months. <laughs> not, it's not three years growing. What, um, its roots were growing at 20 millimetres a day. <laughs> now this is, this is an extremely good site, um, but it just shows what can, what can happen. But if you're growing this on the side of a mudstone hill, that to get even a root system like that, you'd be looking at probably 15. All right, so so we know we know we know we know what slope stability effects we have, but we also know what happens when the trees are harvested. So this diagram um, shows what we call the window of vulnerability between uh, the harvesting of the old crop and the regrowth of the new crop. So you've got uh, the dotted lines showing the root reinforcement from the previous crop decreasing really rapidly, uh, while the uh, replacement uh, root reinforcement uh, is increasing through time, and there's a period right there in the middle um, where you're actually most uh, vulnerable. Um, and Chris is going to talk about um, some recent results with respect to that, but it pretty much supports this diagram that around uh, two to four years old, uh, you're at, uh, you at your most um, vulnerable in terms of root reinforcement. And that's typically when a lot of the landslides occur. What age was it? Uh, two to four years after harvest. Mm.
So, th and there's some other things uh, that happen when we harvest the trees. So, there's a whole lot of disturbance goes on. So, we build the roads and landings. Um, we uh, create a lot of surface soil disturbance through the harvesting and mechanical land preparation. There's always a lot of bare ground that people focus on a lot because it looks pretty ugly. Um, the little bit of science that has been done shows that not much of the sediment comes off those bare areas. Uh, it's, most of the sediment uh, is being produced by uh, landslides during storm events. We produce a whole lot of slash typically, although this is changing I think um, as time goes by that there's more of an emphasis now, now on better slash management in terms of recovery off the slates but also in terms of what we do with that slash uh, when we're processing it. Um, but it is, you know, we've already talked about the, the dangers of slash uh, being mobilised by landslides and debris flows and that's mostly what really annoys people. Yeah. Um, and runoff does increase. When you remove um, the tree canopy cover, then you get increased runoff and bank erosion can increase. We don't know the extent to which that uh, contributes, um, but it can be uh, probably. So I've talked briefly about um, slash, and ironically a little bit of residual slash is really good for organic matter return, nutrient cycling, and surface soil protection, so there's an upside of slash, but it's the issue around too much slash and uh, defining what that might be uh, and the extent to which it can be mobilised uh, during big storms. Um, there's still a, a debate about uh, the sources of that slash. A lot of people see it as coming off the clear cuts, uh, and there's no doubt that some of it comes off slash being uh, stored in inappropriate locations, either on landings or too close to streams. Um, and there's been recent prosecutions with respect to that in the North Island. Right, so just in terms of landslide sources, which is mostly what I want to focus on in terms of risk management, is that. Um, I mean, it's our view that, that the large amounts of sediment that we see delivered during the large storm events mostly come from landsliding and debris flows. As the surface erosion, the rill erosion uh, doesn't produce a huge amount of sediment, but it's the landslides and debris flows, and they can either occur on the clear cuts, and you saw that, well, I'm going to show the picture again in a minute, uh, and uh, from the infrastructure, from the roads and landings. And, but I argue that risk management needs to focus on how do we better manage those landslide and debris flow um, risks. I'm gonna, the next picture is uh, the same thing we same picture we saw before and Chris has already alluded to the fact that um, we've got sources here on the clear cuts and sources on from infrastructure and he's going to talk about some recent work that he's done in quantifying how much of the land siding occurs from infrastructure because often the finger is pointed at the forestry companies in terms of their infrastructure generating a lot of the sediment. Um, you can see in this image um, by far and away the most sediment is being produced off land sides on the clear cuts and it's uh, relatively easy to try and manage what goes on around your roads and landings, it's much less uh, easy to figure out what the hell do we do about the clear cuts uh, to reduce the amount of land. Uh, so what controls the response to rainfall events? Um, I'd argue that the primary control is rainfall. So the total amount, um, the intensity, duration, return period, characteristics of the storm, the area of the storm and how wet the soils were beforehand. And the diagram shows some uh, recent work that Brenda Ross, Ross at GNS has done uh, looking at the relationship between rainfall, duration and intensity and where landslides do and don't occur. Uh, and you can see there's an envelope there where landslides will most likely occur, uh, there's an upper bound where they almost certainly will occur and at the lower end um, they may occur and I, su I suspect the, the dots uh, in the zone where it says may occur are probably where you had higher antecedent moisture conditions but that, that to me I think is the primary driver um, for the response to um, or the landslide response is you know, how much does it rain and how hard does it rain, how long does it rain. The erodibility of the underlying rock is clearly important and that's why we're here to talk about separation point granite because it is by far and away the most erodible rock type we have to deal with here in Tasman district. Topography, typically sleep, steep, slope steepness and aspect often uh, have influence on the amount of landsliding. And vegetation, you know, as we've demonstrated, um, does have an influence, even if it's second order influence. There's no doubt it does have influence. And it's the time since harvest, the area that's been harvested, um, the density of the trees that were left in the ground, and the species uh, of trees uh, probably all uh, have influence on the response that occurs to any given landslide event.
risky risk management. Uh, this, this is my statement of the uh, real question that we face, and um, I guess this is up for debate amongst this audience. You may or may not agree with this, but to me it's about how do we best manage for the benefits of forestry while minimising the risk during and post-harvest. Um, that's the position I hold, um, but clearly some people in the room, particularly with respect to separation point granite, might, might not um, agree that that's the correct statement of, of the problem. But in any case, the National Environmental Standard for Plantation Forestry attempts to do this uh, balancing act uh, using an, the erosion susceptibility classification, and that underpins the rule set for controlling um, forestry activities. And it does, as Pauline said earlier on, it allows for greater stringency in the rules on separation point granite, which to my knowledge really hasn't been uh, utilised. Um, so the next question is about what's wrong with the NESPF and to me it has a number or well, two major li limitations. One is its conceptual basis so it was based on this poorly defined concept called potential erosion which sort of mixed up um, the underlying susceptibility of the land with the frequency of erosion causing events with the consequences of those events and came up uh, with a, a uh, ranking of what the potential erosion was um, and it's a really messy concept, it was very subjective and it's during the course of development of the erosion susceptibility classification, it was prone to a lot of debate uh, between the various communities of interest with respect to the development of the NESPF. So to me it doesn't have a risk management basis, so it doesn't start with the susceptibility of the land, uh, then independently analyse what's the hazard uh, from erosion triggering events, which includes both the climatic um, factors and, and vegetation cover change, and it doesn't uh, deal with risks um, uh, specifically. And the other question that it's uh, really poor on is its scale or resolution. So it was derived from the New Zealand Land Resource Inventory, the underlying mapping is 1 to 50,000 scale at best and for operational forest management we need uh, coverage at 1 to 10,000 or better. So next slide. So this shows the erosion susceptibility classification mapping for Tasman District. Um, you can see that it's very broad brush, it has uh, very little spatial resolution and on the right um, I've got the separation point granite plotted and you can see that by and large separation point granite got passed in the orange zone and the reasons that it was in orange rather than red which uh, some people advocated for was as I've outlined previously that compared to the soft rock hill country of the North Island it is less. Anyway, so I don't think the ESC can be usefully modified and improved uh, and we need to replace it with a risk management framework because um, to me that if, if we can go down a risk management framework we can then make some objective decisions about where we need greater stringency and what that greater stringency might So we've done some work in this space recently. Um, um, land care research and one of the local forestry companies um, but ju just in terms of the basis of risk management this, this is what I've already stated this stuff about um, the focus has got to be on the window of vulnerability and landslides and debris flows so moving to the next slide so the fundamental basis of risk is defined by the integration of the susceptibility of the underlying land determined by things like geology slope aspect the physical characteristics of the land uh, the hazards that's created by erosion triggering events whether that be uh, rainfall triggering or land and cover change triggering and the consequences whether that to be to property to life uh, to the environment um, all of those things need to be looked at independently and then integrated together uh, to come up with an overall assessment um, right so there are methods available for evaluating landslide and debris flow susceptibility so we've recently done some work for one of the local forestry companies and so we uh, developed a landslide susceptibility model with landslide being a function of slope geology and aspect um, we also modelled and mapped connectivity uh, because, as Chris has pointed out, not all landslides deliver into stream channels, so it's where landslides are delivering sediment into channels is uh, where um, it's, it's more, um, it creates a greater uh, hazard. Uh, and then we um, modelled debris flow susceptibility. So uh, this takes a catchment based analysis and what happens with debris flows is that there's three conditions um, to create debris flows. One is high rainfall, uh, second is high sediment supply and the third is typically steep slopes. 
And so what we do is we take, just, just go back a minute, we take um, the, we define the catchment uh, with low sloping land, uh, because debris flows typically uh, generate on steep slopes, but they deposit where uh, slopes lessen. Um, so the susceptibility analysis for debris flows looks at the catchments contributing to those low slope areas, um, and we use some metrics called Melton Ratio, which is an index of how rugged your catchment is and the catchment lengths. Um, and those those metrics and those susceptibility approaches are well established uh, in the in the literature, both internationally uh, and. With so just next slide. So this is the forest estate that we looked at. Um, some people will probably recognise whose it is, but that's the erosion susceptibility classification from the NES. And again, you can see it's pretty broad brush stuff. Uh, separation point granite um, is the area uh, right on the western side of that diagram. We put up the next slide. This is the result of our landslide susceptibility analysis. And you can see that there's a level of resolution and granularity of the data, particularly in the Mutri gravels um, and in the North Bank forest, uh, which gives you information at more operational forest scale, where you can start to make decisions about um, coops and catchments uh, and what their uh, susceptibility is. We then looked at um, the uh, susceptibility to debris flows. We actually looked at debris flows and debris floods, but I won't, won't talk about the difference between those. Um, so this is the debris flow analysis, and for this we use different metrics um, for melt and ratio and catchment lengths on the granite terrain compared uh, to the non-granite terrain. Different um, thresholds. Pardon? Uh, different thresholds yes. for the melt and ratio. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess it's the key thing about that map is it shows a large part of this forest estate is potentially prone to debris flows and that is a worry. Um, so we went the next step where we, next slide, so in this map what we've done is combined, uh, because debris flows typically require high sediment supply, we combine the high and very high landslide susceptibility classes, so we're likely to generate uh, more sediment uh, with the connectivity um, and with the debris flow susceptibility to define uh, which parts of that forest estate would be most prone to both landslides and debris flows. And that starts to give you a different picture across the estate about the areas which are most prone to both landslides and debris. So the next thing, piece of work we did uh, for them was to look at the rainfall hazard. So this starts to address the question about um, the rainfall triggers. Um, for landslides and debris flows. So NIWA has a really nice database of rainfall depth, duration, frequency for the whole country. I can't remember the spatial resolution off the top of my head, um, but it's reasonably detailed. Uh, and it also provides information on the effect of climate change on these statistics. So this table shows the millimetres of rainfall uh, that occurs over uh, durations from 1 to 48 hours and return periods out uh, to 100 years. And we typically think of 24-hour uh, rainfalls of something like 100 to 150 millimetres as potentially generating landslides. And so you can see from the 24-hour duration row there that a large part of this forest estate uh, is potentially prone to uh, landslide triggering events. So again, that's quite a worry. Just in relation to the question that was asked before about the effect of climate change on these statistics, I didn't plot this on this diagram, um, but the, the absolute changes in these numbers uh, predicted by NIWA is not all that large. Um, but what they do is they assume, they assume there's, a, 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 uh, I guess, a stationary scaling between the magnitude of rainfall and the frequency of it occurring. So if, let's say if you added um, 40 millimetres, uh, or let's say 20 millimetres to the five-year um, return period, 24-hour rainfall, you, you added uh, 20 millimetres to that, you're up at 100 millimetres. Um, and you're, you're up into the 10 year uh, return period event. So um, that's why the argument uh, at present that uh, is advanced by the meteorologists is that we're not only going to see uh, more rain in these storms, but they're going to occur. The, the interesting thing about this work was that remember the, the uh, map I showed of landslide susceptibility with the greatest susceptibility over in the separation point granites on the left hand side of the diagram. Um, the map for 
uh, rainfall hazard is the reverse. So the riskiest parts um, in terms of rainfall hazard are in the Rye and Wangamara and so on, and that probably matches people's perception. So that's why looking at them independently is much better than trying to mass them. So next picture, um, we haven't addressed consequence uh, in this work uh, to this point, but that is the next step in the process. And this is an example from the 2010 storm at Tapawera, um, where there was quite a lot of landsliding in the, the forest uh, just above the slide. And you can see that you've got a number of dwellings uh, built right at the mouth of small fans. It's a terrible place to be building. And they were really lucky in that event that there was no serious damage. It, it could have been much, much worse. So we've got to rationalise uh, land use, um, the upstream land use, with what we've done and how we, how do we go about retrofitting this sort of stuff. It's reasonably easy to figure out how we might um, plan for hazards going forward. It's much more difficult to retrofit what we've already done. I think there's one more slide which I oh know. No, this is, yeah, so this is my, my take on the options for greater stringency on separation point granite uh, as a closer. Um, I've crossed out business as usual because I don't think anybody in the room believes that business as usual is an option for us. Um, I think targeted restrictions uh, on reforestation uh, are a definite first uh, step that we should be taking and I include in that voluntary retirement um, of land from plantation forestry which some companies are doing already. Um, the other, th these are not necessarily my ideas, these are ideas that are around in the literature and have been advanced by a number of uh, commentators. Small coop harvesting and continuous cover forestry, a um, number of commentators like uh, the forestry group, I have to say, um, raised a number of objections about those as concepts uh, for commercial plantation forests in New Zealand. Longer rotation species um, spreads the risk over a longer time period, uh, but you still still going to harvest them at some point, so you've got a period where you're still going to be uh, vulnerable. And there's a view that's already been expressed in the room today around blanket prohibition of forestry. Um, I'd argue though that we need to develop a consistent and defensible approach um, that can help us with making these decisions about which way do we go, how do we decide um, what, we should ha what we should harvest, um, what sort of practices should we use during that harvest um, and post-harvest period in terms of erosion and sediment control, um, and how do we decide uh, what we walk away from, and how do we, how do, we do that? Uh, it's, a, it's a serious land use uh, transition question um, where, to me, central government has to play a key role in advancing what's needed. The last slide goes back to the messages that I started with, which is we can't, we can't stop erosion. We can manage it to a certain extent. Um, we've got to focus on that post-harvest period, and we've got to get better at